Alright, so let's start with the uh, uh, Mexican population as a whole. So there are, uh, Mexico has about 110 million people. And there are, there's a social security system, and the social security system is very, very fragmented. So to start with, you have uh, what is called IMSS. So IMSS basically is the social security for the private sector. So if you are a private sector worker, then in theory, you are covered by IMSS. Um, <clears throat> why I say in theory is because if you are working in the private sector, then there are two parts to the private sector. One is the private sector, uh, which is formal. So if you are working in the formal sector, and the other is the informal sector. Uh, and if you look at the private sector as a whole, <clears throat> more than half the people in the private sector are not covered by uh, IMSS. Okay. So they are informal workers. What are they? Well, typically they would be things like uh, people who are working in uh, small enterprises, meaning two people, three people, they have a little shop, or you see all the you know shops on the side of the street, they are all informal sector. Um, <clears throat> so these are people who don't have any social security coverage. Does that mean that they don't pay taxes? They don't pay taxes. Okay. But you can, uh, uh, if you if you if you if you go to IMSS and say, okay, I have a small two people company and I want to enroll in social security, you can. Of course, you have to pay yeah. taxes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not not taxes, taxes, taxes. Not in the sense of uh, tax for your income, but you have to declare some income. Okay. And so most people obviously in this situation they don't want to declare anything. No, no. Uh, so, they, so more than half the people who are working in the private sector are not covered at all. Okay. So in the private sector, less than half the people have any kind of either social security, uh, pension, and or uh, this, this health care coverage. Okay. And then there is the government sector. So the government sector is at the very top level is the federal government. Yeah. So people who are working for the federal government, uh, obviously they are covered. They are in the formal sector, yeah. so they have coverage. There is another system called ISTE. Yeah. So they, they, they are covered by the ISTE. And then uh, that's about 5-6% uh, of the population. Then there are paraestatales sort of... Uh, you know, the ones that are uh, government dependent national level things like Pemex, yeah. the petrol company, uh, which is a monopoly in Mexico. They are covered by their own uh, thing and they have like, uh, you said you're going to the hospital Angeles? Right around the corner there's another funky looking building that looks like a cylinder. Uh, that's the Pemex hospital. So if you're, a, if you're a Pemex employee, you can go there and they have all the best equipments and best doctors okay. uh, around. Uh, Iste is also reasonably good. Um, um, they cover all the federal level things. The state governments, so there are 31 states, and uh, each state has its own equivalent of Iste. Okay. So, <coughs> state of Mexico, they have uh, their own East states called Isemim. Okay. They cover their uh, employees in that, <clears throat> and so on. So each state has its own. Yeah. At the next level of the government, at the municipal level, they might have their own little uh, systems. Yeah. So uh, in all, there are about 500 different little systems of social security. I see, I see. The biggest one, obviously, is IMSS. Next comes ISTE, and then there are these for uh, you know for for the armed forces okay. for Pemex for other uh, larger government police force they all have their own little uh, systems and so they, they they do treat just their own group okay. and then you have this población abierta basically uh, slightly more than 50% of the population who have no coverage whatsoever yeah.
So the only thing that they have, I mean, they can do now. There's there's something called Seguro Popular. Yeah, I heard about that. That's that's that has been launched. Well, it's been launched and relaunched for a number of times. Uh, the general problem with with uh, Seguro Popular is that um, you have a coverage in theory, yeah. but uh, the hospitals and stuff they have are extremely basic. So you go to a uh, clinic of 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 uh, Seguro Popular. Well, th there may be a room, but no bed. <laughs> to take your own bed. Yeah. If they have a bed, they have no you know no linens, no nothing. So you really? have to carry your own stuff. Really? In fact, you have to do that in some of the news hospitals as well. Well, because you know, people steal them. <laughs> really. Actually, I've only visited private hospitals so far, and so it's going to be a different experience when I start visiting Seguro Popular. <laughs> it would be, but I don't know how you are contacting them and how you are going around doing those things because yeah. they might take you to one which is, you know, the the nicest. The nicest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, unless you go to some remote places, you may not really see the real picture because obviously. You know, in Mexico is very urbanized, mm -hmm. so about 85% of the people live in urban areas. Okay. Unlike, say, in India or China, where more than half the people live in rural areas, yeah. and Mexico is very urbanized. But that doesn't mean that they all got urban facilities. You know, no. if you're if you if you're living in a little shack somewhere in Mexico City, you don't get to go to a city like this. <laughs> okay. Uh, so so. There, there's a big difference in, in terms of, a huge difference in terms of what they can get. And yeah. that, that came out very strongly when uh, there was this problem with, uh, with uh, uh, influenza in 2009, uh, where Mexican government said, okay, we open the door for other hospitals, for anybody yeah. who suffers from this can go into the IMSS hospitals, for yeah. example. Yeah. And so there were tons of people who went in that had nothing to do with influenza. They had some problem, they thought, well, oh, so I can get free treatment, <laughs> might as well go. Mm -hmm. So they had a lot of problems with that. And wow. the hospitals got just completely saturated because of that. Because more than half the people who went to the hospital had nothing to do with influenza. Wow. Maybe they just transmitted uh, to each other <laughs> while waiting in the queue. They could have fit will have. Yeah. But uh, so that's that's the general general problem. Okay. So when you say you know they use only four instead of yeah. two hundred, it's um, it's um, it doesn't surprise me at all because no. uh, uh, especially in in the in the hospitals that are IMSS hospitals, yeah. they are. Uh, I mean, they, IMSS is also a very heterogeneous kind of thing. If you go to some of the specialists. Hospitals of IMSS, they are really, really good. Uh, you know, they have the best of doctors, they have the best of equipments. But once you go away from the main urban centers, uh, then then you have this huge, huge problem. Yeah, I just want to show you that this is actually what they give kids in even the private hospitals. Uh -huh. And this is one you normally use for the nose. Um, and then they reuse it, so they put it in here. They have some kind of formula, and then this formula lasts for five days. But don't they, isn't isn't it uh, sterilized in the? Yeah, so it's like it's they don't call it sterile catheterization; they call uh -huh. it clean catheterization because there's no it's not sterile. It's just like it's washed kind of. But uh, mm. so that mm -hmm. means that there's a higher risk of infections, of course. But uh, when you were say, talking about what kind of equipment, like even in the very good hospitals, uh, they simply don't have access. There's no, these uh, producers or suppliers of, uh, of the right catheters, uh, mm -hmm. they are not uh, supplying to Mexico. At all? At all. So even the leading doctors in urology... So is it, is it a problem of information? It's, it's definitely has something to do with also information and awareness. Um, but it's also something to do with like purchasing power, I guess. Yes. I mean, no, I, I I can see yeah. that you know, it, it, it's like the olden days when they used to use needles for for giving injections. Yeah. You know, the same ones was used over and over again. Yeah. Partly because it's still done in, in 
very many countries, uh, and it has to do with purchasing power there. Yeah. Uh, but education. Uh, and an education. Yeah. 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 And and you know, doctors might think, well, it's a waste of money to buy so many. Yeah. And they use the same thing for the nose for operations uh, for urinary catheterization. They don't even they're not even called uh, urinary catheters. They're just called. Uh, Multi-purpose something. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Sorry, it was not to interrupt. It just wanted no, to be no, 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 here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, the, in, in general, in, in the IMS hospitals, there yeah. would be problems with um, with um, with uh, medication, for example. Yeah. Um, so, typically, if you're if you're a patient, you go to a hospital, and they say, okay, you need to take. You know, there's a doctor who yeah. treats you and he tells you that you need to take that medicine. So, in theory, you go to the supplies, which is attached to the hospital, and he writes a, a note and you get, in theory, you get it for free. But suppose you have some sort of a disease and then you go there and they say, we're out of them, we don't have them. Yeah. And the supply will come next month. Obviously, you can't wait until next month. No. So, if you go to any of the IMS hospital, just look around, you'll see that around the hospitals, there's a whole bunch of clinics that have cropped up, uh, 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 medical supply stores and uh, you know, medicine stores and so on, all around them. They're benefiting from the public being out of stock. <laughs> yep. Exactly. That's their main business. Okay. That's their principal business. And you can go and get the even the prescribed medicine there? Yes. Okay. If the IMS gives you a note, yeah. the doctor's note, you can take that across the street and they will give but it to you. But you have to pay right. yourself. That's the catch. Yeah. And you have to pay it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and if you look at how much uh, Mexicans spend out of pocket, yeah. it's at the national level it's higher as a proportion of GDP than what comes from the public yeah. fund. Yeah. And, uh, if you go to other countries, I mean, I'm not talking That's about the uh, developed countries, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the, uh, or Scandinavian countries, there obviously it's a different story. <laughs> but uh, even other countries with the same level of development as Mexico, say Turkey or Malaysia, a lot more money is spent from the public sector than people pay out of pocket for these things. So it's 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 a very very different kind of situation. I see, I see. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so in in general, you know, even if you are covered in theory, in practice is a different story. Yeah. And I suspect the these things are as a as a as a symptom of that because mm -hmm. they might have a supply of this much, but you know they run out of supply, and that's it. So they have to ration them for a month rather than 200 a month because yeah. the difference is really, really big. Yeah. Although you might think that, you know, 60 cents, 60 US cents is not a lot of money, but we add up 200 and yeah. we are talking about people who are probably permanently paralyzed yeah. for the rest of their lives. Yeah. You add up, you know, number of years that these people would live, yeah. it's a, a substantial, especially people who are at the poor end of the scale. Yeah. If you're if you're if you're on the higher end of the scale, then you probably get the same level of uh, uh, care as as you would get in a developed country. Yeah, and if you're really cynical, you they might even be cheaper uh, going with the reusable one, getting infections because and then you die, you die earlier. And but I mean, <laughs> you cannot make those things up in economics. But uh, that's why I think it, economic. Uh, Cost benefit will not be favorable for this kind of product because, in reality, yes, it's not going to reduce the, the uh, cost for the patient, it's going to increase the cost. That's right, the cost for the system. <laughs> That's right, and also, the, the <coughs> doctors who work here, um, you know, if you talk to any doctor who work in the private sector, they also are affiliated typically with. A government hospital. Yeah. So you go ask for treatment for something and they will typically tell you that okay this is this is what you got it's really complicated 
and if you are just with him, it's not going to fix you. Why don't you come to my clinic, private clinic, which I go to in the afternoon, and see me there? <laughs> and I will treat you there. So if you're okay. yeah. if you're desperate enough, or if you have enough money, you will say, "Okay, I will do that." And that's what a lot of people. Do. Yeah. So that's that's how it works. The doctors I met with in the private sector said that their patients are completely price insensitive. That they will get, uh, like either they have an insurance or they just have enough money. Uh, yes. So if these products were in the market, they would give them to the patients because it's the best product in the market. There would not be any price sensitivity, according to them. I have still only interviewed two doctors, but in the private. Yeah. See, uh, if you look at Mexican income distribution, mm. it's extremely unequal. Mm. Uh, so, <clears throat> probably top five, ten percent of the population, they they are they will be price sensitive. Yeah. Uh, but that leaves out another ninety percent of the people, yeah. and that, that's that is very price sensitive. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the the higher you go on the scale, and probably. You know, if you if you look at the price of one of these products, it's, like they, it's not much money. But if you add them up, say ten years worth of use, and even in one month, like two hundred times four dollars, yeah. so it's like eight hundred dollars. That's a lot. Eight hundred dollars yeah. a month, and that's a lot. Of money. Yeah, that's a lot. Of money. I mean, average income in in Mexico is around. Fourteen thousand yeah. dollars, and that's the average. Yeah. Uh, so, if you look at the proportion of number of people who live below, say, two dollars a day, yeah. that's about fifteen percent of Mexican population. Oh, that's a lot. $2. That's twenty million people. Well. <laughs> Poverty is big problem in Mexico. Half the population in Mexico live below the poverty line, the official poverty line. Wow. Uh, so this $14,000 business is, is very deceptive. Mm, a lot of people just don't have, have the money. This is just the money. Um, and, and especially, you know, when you're talking about a person who's probably going to be Disabled for the rest of his or li her life. He's well, not going to have income. That's right. Yeah. So there is no social return, no nothing. No. I mean, basically, you're you're trying to be compassionate, and that's that's why you want to give them this yeah. this benefit. But in economic terms, you know, when economists would look at it, they say, "Well, these guys are as good as dead for us. Yeah. They're in fact costing us money." Yeah. So, as it's you said simple. earlier. Yeah. Quicker they go, the better. Yeah. 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 So. So, what exactly? What constitutes your project then? So it's uh, in two parts. Mm -hmm. uh, the first part is uh, to estimate uh, what is the current market potential uh, for cathedrals, intermittent cathedrals. So that's both the coded and uncoded in the market. Um, and then. How are you planning to do that? So uh, I have like a model that I'm using. Uh -huh. um, where, like, you no, but where is your data? Ah, so I'm interviewing doctors to get uh -huh. some data. Um, I'm, I will have to apply some numbers, like incident rates uh, for other countries that are similar. Okay. Um, if you have some ideas for how I could do it, please <laughs> share. But the uh, statistics here in Mexico is quite limited. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> that's what worries me. <laughs> and everything is very fragmented, so, uh, yes. so I'm still trying to figure out exactly how to do it, but right now I'm, I'm conducting these uh, questionnaires with the doctors to get an idea of the different systems, uh, how many patients they have of different kind, uh, how many uh, of these cathedrals, how many of 40 cathedrals, 40 is a permanent cathedral that can be converted, like the patients that use 40 can be converted into using intermittent, and this is the standard of care, the guidelines internationally, mm -hmm. because 40, the permanent cathedral causes a lot of uh, bad side effects, like uh, you, you basically the bladder starts uh, deforming, uh, and it causes other chronic diseases. So it's right. 
very bad. Right. right. But here, uh, I mean, around 50% of the patients that could use intermittent catheters, they uh -huh. are using Foley catheters. 50%? 50%, approximately. So um, I'm going for a conference here in the weekend uh, with urologists from all over the country, so I think that will give There's a, a urological conference or something? Yeah, in Guadalajara. Guadalajara. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there I will know a bit better, but at least the impression I have so far is about uh, these numbers. Okay. So. so you're going to do a survey there? Yeah, so I'm going to interview uh, a lot of different urologists from around the country to get a bit of like a, an overview, a map. <laughs> okay. Um, but like, so I'm, I'm having um, a framework that has been used before for emerging markets. Yeah. Uh, I'm borrowing a framework from this company, Kodoplast. Let's we'll see where the name is. Okay, no worries. I don't know why it doesn't say Coloplast, but uh, this this is Coloplast. Uh -huh. It's here, Coloplast. Uh -huh. um, they are supporting my studies. Uh, uh, they are supporting me economically by covering data collection expenses, okay. and they are also giving me some tools. Uh -huh. So, but it's not a project that is uh, exclusively for them. It's a project that it has relevance for a lot of people in Mexico, right. and for other companies as well. Right. Um, so, um, so. No, that's what we, yeah, so how I'm going to do it? Well, they have a framework um, where they time like there's a population of patients that you times with the, the value of each patient, and then you break that down. The value of each patient mm -hmm. is a function of uh, how many products do you use per day, <laughs> uh, what's the price per product, do you use uh, other kind of catheters like are there, uh, a basket of different catheters you use, stuff like that. So that's a value. Um, and then you have uh, the population, which can be calculated in four different ways. Uh, one way is by using, um, if you actually have the, the numbers of patients in Denmark, because of the health system, we have electronic registration. We would have all the numbers of the prevalence of these diseases and how many that, that have this neurogenic bladder condition that requires catheters. So that's easy peasy. In uh, more emerging markets, there are no such numbers. So yes. then the way to go is to, for instance, use an instance rate for another country, mm -hmm. uh, times that with the population that is in the cities because they are the ones that are accessible. Then times that with, uh, let me think, with the need for care because incidence rate, the, the fact that you have spina bifida mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you need catheter. It's maybe only 60% of patients with that. So the need but for care. But it would be a fixed proportion or, or some number that you would know. Yeah, mm -hmm. so so try to get these numbers uh, by asking doctors questions, by using from similar countries. Uh, similar what other similar countries do you have in mind compared to uh, Brazil or Argentina. Actually Argentina is probably the most developed market in Latin America mm -hmm. for, for cathedrals. Okay, and they have higher use there? Yeah, uh, and that's because uh, <coughs> there's more awareness and more education uh, about catheters. Um, when I meet doctors here in uh, Mexico, some of the doctors they tell me they have actually never been uh, trained or like uh, had a formal training in how to use catheters, how to teach their patients. It's something that, is, that they, le they learn on the job. <laughs> um, there's no dedicated nurses to teach uh, these patients how to use it. So a lot of patients, they end up going with the permanent catheter they, Where they, they, they need an intermittent one. Yeah, they need intermittent, yeah, because it, it's, it's the best, uh, like it reduces the side effects and it, it gives you flexibility because you can move around, you can have a normal life. You just, right. you just use this for 15 minutes when you have to urinate and then you are fit. Uh, like and you do your normal. You do your normal. So, right. so it's a huge difference from having something permanently attached to you, a bag on your leg yes. that collects the urine. Yeah. Um, some even have like a, a system, cystus for me, which is like a hole into the, the bladder where this permanent catheter is attached. I mean, so they punch a hole on the side? Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. Because it reduces the number of infections compared to having it through the urinary tract. I see. But all these things are, are like, a, it's, um, it's not optimal solutions. Right. Uh, so, 
So I really hope that by having this project, by talking with these people, by working together with patient organizations, mm -hmm. that this can increase the awareness and the standard of care. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, the, the awareness is, is obviously you know, lacking in all over. Again, going back to the um, uh, uh, example of, 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 of uh, um, the influenza, yeah. One of the things happened, um, I, I did some work on, on the influenza when it was happening in Mexico. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I, we saw with the data was that uh, during that period when there was a lot of restrictions on, on people, um, the number of people who are visiting uh, hospitals for, um, uh, for, for uh, stomach infections, you know, stomach problems, diarrhea, dramatically dropped and the reason was that a great number of people were not eating in the streets and when they prepare food in the street they don't wash their hands no. so you know that problem for a week it That's went away really interesting. <laughs> and of course then it came back but that was because of our awareness of, uh, of uh, the flu. That and, 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 and people, 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 are, people were washing their hands. But once the flu was gone, they stopped washing their hands. And then it came back. Of course. <laughs> so, so, you know, awareness, we saw that, you know, with the, with the data, that yeah. it makes a big difference. But to make that stick, it just didn't happen. Wow. So it's like, a, it's used like they don't understand the root of the problem. Yes. It's like they associate influenza with lack of washing hands, but they don't understand that the whole. That it has all of other implications exactly. as well. Yes. yes. So that's 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 the general thing we saw very clearly. Wow. And, and why is it so? Because I mean, Mexican seems to be well educated, have uh, one of the best health systems. I mean, there's a lot of uh, medical tourism, people traveling to Mexico to have surgeries. Yes, but that's for other reasons. Mm -hmm. For example. You know, Mexico has a lot of U.S. trained doctors. Yeah. So when you go to Hospital Angeles, you'll see a lot of these people have degrees from Harvard and all that. Yeah. The reason why they don't practice in the U.S. is that there is a lot of lawsuits. So if you treat a patient and something goes wrong, then they will sue you. And so it costs a lot of money. For, I mean, I have a friend of mine who's a gynecologist in Houston. He pays uh, his his insurance premium for uh, 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 childbirth is half a million dollars. His insurance premium, annual insurance premium. Of course, he makes makes a million dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a lot of money to <laughs> just insure yourself. Exactly. Mm. So, if they come to you know, if they are, for example, if they speak Spanish, if they come to Mexico, or they don't even have to speak Spanish because you know the elite in Mexico can very well manage it with English. Yeah. They come to Mexico to to do their business. All of a sudden you have the same income because you get the same patients coming from the US to have your treatment. Yeah. But none of the costs. Because you cannot sue in Mexico? Well you can sue, but getting a result out of this good luck. <laughs> but if it's and the same patient, why would they not sue in Mexico if they would sue in the US? Because in the US if you sue then the court typically sides with you ah, and favorite, more sympathetic right. to you. Here, for example, if you have a lawsuit, it will take years before anything gets resolved. <laughs> By the time you're probably dead. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, so there's, there's not much point in suing in Mexico. So even though they may be paid a little bit less for the, the practice here in Mexico, it's worth so, it because... And, and you see that across the border, you know, there's a whole way from Tijuana all the way down to the East Coast, you see all the doctors lined up on the right across the border on this side of the border. <laughs> yeah. And and they do the treatment, you know, you get good dentists and everything. Mm. Now they are board certified and all that in the US, mm. but they are coming here to practice because they can make money and there's no lawsuits involved. So then how come in, in US uh, there's this Medicare system that recently uh, changed the, the guidelines for, for neurogenic bladder? Mm -hmm. So instead of of giving four catheters per month, they now give 200 catheters per month. And that applies to all disabled people mm -hmm. and to all elder people above 65. Uh -huh. And that happens like overnight or like <laughs> with the new reforms. Uh, 
that's a huge change. And, yes. and I mean, if these doctors, they are aware of the, the guidelines in the US, yeah. why do they not bring it to well, Mexico? Or if you have an idea, I know it's not your, your area. I, but I, I, I suspect that part of the reason is, is, is that, you know, here, even in the US or any place else, unless there are guidelines set by the medical board or somebody, they don't necessarily follow those things. I mean, you, you see that, for example, uh, with with, uh, with uh, washing hands. You compare uh, hospital infections in the U.S. and hospital infection in Europe, Western Europe, I'm talking yeah. about. The hospital infection rate in, in the U.S. is double that of the Europe. Oh. Why? Because they don't have this kind of washing hand guidelines that they, they're mandatory in Europe. Yeah. In the US, to make something mandatory is very complicated. Okay. You know, people just wouldn't accept, you know, this is mandatory, they don't like it. They you have to have a choice. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Freedom comes at a price. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know if you read uh, today's uh, news. It's, there was one guy in, in Ohio, He's, uh, he has several kids. One of the kids died last year because uh, instead of going to the doctors, they decided that they are going to pray. And the kid died without treatment. And yesterday, another kid of his died for the same reason. That's he refused to take the kid to the doctor. Now in the U.S., you can do that and you, you, there is no punishment for that. Wow. If you do that in Europe, next thing yeah. they will take your kids away and yeah. throw you in jail. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. I mean, you know, child neglect is extremely yeah. serious in yeah, Europe. Yeah. Yeah. In the U.S., it's not. And how is it in Mexico? There's well, no such system in place to identify or detect. I mean, as I said, okay. half the more than half the people don't have medical care, any medical care to speak yeah. of. So yeah. you can imagine how that would be. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so how do you see the system evolving? Like, uh, because. The recent years, they have, uh, I think, Seguro Popular has, in, has increased, right? The budget for Seguro Popular? Has increased, yes. Yeah. Yes. I know it's still below the average uh, in Far Latin below, America, yeah. yeah. But uh, wh where do you see it going? Do you think there will be some kind of uh, reimbursement eventually, or do you think... No, unless, unless they can... <clears throat> unless they can improve upon, for example, buying of the government of various medication. Like uh, when the first implemented Seguro Popular mm. in Chiapas, yeah. they found that the same medication, they were paying 30 times the price they were paying in Mexico City. 30 times the same medication. In, in Mexico City they were paying 30 times? No. no. In Chiapas they were paying ah. 30 times. So how come? What was the reason? Because they were all buying things locally. And, and the people, who are, yeah, people okay. who are supplying them, they were charging them whatever it is. Okay. Because the government doesn't really care. Okay. It's so not it's their just, money. Ah, okay, so it's managed then, at a state level of yeah, municipal at level. at that time. Okay. Then they decided, okay, we are going to have a nationwide uh, 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 subasta uh, 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 procurement system so that people will pay, uh, they will bid for whatever we are buying at that level and then they will be redistributed. And now that that prob that particular problem has been solved, but it hasn't solved at all levels, and and and, and that's that's a big problem. Yeah. You know, you, you, if you have uh, unless these processes are transparent, there is there is no uh, no no way of resolving these problems. When government buys things in bulk quantities, large quantities, they don't necessarily pay the lowest possible price, no. and that. You know, that also applies with, with a lot of, uh, with, with respect to drugs, for example, it applies to uh, things like medication for HIV AIDS. Mm. Uh, HIV AIDS medication, Mexico, you know, if you, if you suffer from HIV AIDS in theory, you get free treatment. Okay, that's, so you get triple yeah. cocktail free okay. from the government. Okay. It doesn't matter, you don't have to be affiliated with, you don't have to be formal sector. You get it for free. Because it's a priority, like there are certain uh, pathologies that are prioritized. Mm -hmm. It has been prioritized uh, six, Birth seven mortality years ago. also, right? Birth mortality. It's some of the, uh, some of the other, other 
Yes, yeah. and a few other things are prioritized, and that that has been that. But so you'll think that Mexico would buy the cheapest possible source of HIV medication in the world market, but they don't. For example, Mexico for each person they pay for one year treatment five thousand dollars worth. But if they can pay five thousand dollars worth of treatment for HIV, which are basically also just a burden to society, right? Mm -hmm. How? How can they not do it for computers? <laughs> it's not a priority. Nobody has made it a priority. So how do we make it a priority? I don't know. You no, tell me. Where does someone look No, no. It has to have some. The way that happened with HIV, there was a lot of political pressure. Okay. So unless there's a political will created and pol you can create political pressure, maybe you can make that a great publicity and you can convince some of the people who are legislators who take up this as a cause that this has to be made a priority yeah. then it can happen yeah. unless that happens this this doesn't happen but the, there's other part of that story that the that HIV and that is they could have bought this medication at a price fraction of that that price I see. if they had bought this medication from India it would have cost two hundred dollars per patient per year Generics from India. Generics from India. Yeah. Instead, they're buying it from patented from the U.S. And why is that? Personal interest. Because of the political pressure. Political pressure, I see. Because the U.S. companies have made sure, they made damn sure, that Mexico doesn't go to India to buy that stuff. It's up to them. So the U.S. government has lent its backing to the pharmaceutical companies so that they can do this business. I see. I see. So how do they do that? Are they, are they paying money under the table or is it just political pressure? It's, well, there are two, two parts to that. Okay. One is, first part is uh, money, not necessarily under the table. If you look at the pharmaceutical companies, they are the biggest donors of election in the U.S. I see. I see. <laughs> that's, an, that's interesting. So they have direct interest and they, they give the money. You know, everything about board, they give the money, and these guys go and canvass for them. Okay. So when they pass some regulation, some legislation, it makes sure that their interest is taken care of. And they also have given money, this is under the table, to some of the Mexican legislators so that they don't go to India to buy that stuff. They get imps to buy the stuff from the U.S. And do these uh, pharmaceuticals also donate money to the political system uh, in Mexico or only to the American? I didn't above know. the table, yeah, above only the to the Americans. Only to the Americans, okay. Under the table, we do know that there are legislators here who get indirect money from, from them. For example, you are uh, a member of parliament and you want to send your school, kid to school in the U.S. So you just contact one of these guys and they'll say, okay, we'll pay, pay for all the education for your kid. They're not paying you money. I see. Nothing is written. It's just good relations. That's right. <laughs> Friendships. <laughs> That's right. You're a good friend. Your friend is lending you money. What's wrong with that? I see, I see. <laughs> Interesting. So everything comes at a price. Yeah. And, and they did the same thing, you know, when, when the Seguro Popular started. Initially, they didn't have any money from the legislator. Yeah. So, where did the first lot of money come from? They came from the tobacco companies. So, <laughs> so the tobacco... Where did they start supporting the, healthcare? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> but they are the ones who actually paid money to for the Seguro Popular. Now, why would tobacco company be so generous with, uh, with Seguro Popular? Yeah. The reason was they made a deal with the government in Mexico that at that time the government was going to raise the taxes on tobacco oh. by X percent, I forget what that amount was. Yeah. And the government said, okay, we will postpone that until another three years or something. Oh. And so... so Tobacco tax will end up being uh, the public health care system That's right. too unprivileged. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So these sorts of deals happen too. Yeah. 
So when you see on the surface, when you see, why is this happening? You really have to dig under the surface to find out why. But it's actually a, a very vicious cycle, this thing of uh, not uh, increasing the taxes on tobaccos because uh, as long as they stay low, there will be more people in need of this health care. Of course. So okay, they pay money uh, to the health care, but I mean, it's only going to increase. Of course. But some people would argue that, well, these people will die early, so they will be off the health care system. <laughs> but before they die early... Before they, they die, they are going to cost a lot of money, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> So do you think this is still happening, that the tobacco industry is financing Siguro Popular? Or do you think it's a past chapter? Or I think initially it did happen, that okay. I know for sure. Okay. Uh, I mean, I knew it firsthand, but now I, I really don't know. I, I don't have much of contact with any other Siguro Popular. Yeah. But I think no, now, now I think the, the legislators have gone through and they have decided that Seguro Popular will be part of the budget. At that time it wasn't. Yeah. And yeah. Um, uh, so, so the initial money came from there. Okay. So today, uh, like, uh, where did the money come from and, and, and what it, are the... It's, it's part of the budget process, you know, every okay. year the government passes budget, you now there's a line item that says Seguro Popular. Okay. So it comes there. Okay. And um, I think, was it last year there came a new president? Uh, in Mexico, in yes. In Mexico, yeah. yeah. And he, I guess he has a new agenda. Uh, where do you think the emphasis would be put? Uh, one, one of, well, uh, in, in, in terms of what? In terms of, uh, like, what is his uh, public, uh, uh, is it called purpose? Or, like, he has some areas that he is mm -hmm. prioritizing. Yeah, so, right, right. So will that be healthcare? Will it be education? Uh, other All healthcare? of them. Okay. All of them. Uh, one of the things is he, he actually made a constitutional amendment for education um, and for for pension he has an agenda and he's working on it in fact I mean the team for was doing the part of the pension bit uh, there and then he has an agenda for health care uh, for example uh, uh, including um, all the mothers uh, with babies, will have free health care. That's yeah. that's one of his initiatives yeah. that he has actually written down that these are my priority areas. Okay. Um, again, if you can include something like that in his priority list, that might be very useful. Okay. But, um, uh, I mean, you know, obviously there are a lot of competing interests I see. on different, different areas. Yeah. So, some of the things will get finance others will not yeah. and there's always a trade-off what gets financed and what doesn't yeah. uh, typically the ones that make the news or that makes headlines or that looks good <laughs> always gets financed okay. the ones that are you know it's 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 like uh, uh, the 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 drugs for neglected diseases you know yeah. there's a list of neglected diseases yeah. nobody wants to develop a, 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 a uh, a vaccination for malaria. Yeah. Why? Because for the drug companies, big drug companies, not much money there. No, no, no. So they have no interest whatsoever. No. And once you have a, a, a vaccination, the problem is solved, yeah. which means your source of income is gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So unless the governments themselves uh, put their weight behind it, these sorts of things don't happen. <clears throat> and and that, that has been historically true for all sorts of diseases, for malaria, for yeah. anything else. It's, it's always the same story. So do you have some specific names or institutions that you think it would be, could be uh, influential uh, to talk to uh, about this problem with uh, the standard of care for, for disabled people? I'm cu currently talking with the... Uh, uh, some I think it's called National Society for Disabled People. It's mm -hmm. a, a society for 1,200 uh, physicians okay. uh, that all, in one way or the other, work with disabled people, and they try to promote guidelines and like for for best standard of care. Okay. Um, but would there be other maybe people that are very influential when they make a statement? Uh, they are listening. Somehow, to somehow you have to get to the government and the politicians. Yeah. To be interested. Okay. Um, uh, to, yeah. through, through the doctors, maybe maybe it's a good idea, but I don't know how much political clout they will have. 
but uh, are there some uh, newspaper uh, that uh, where they have like a leading uh, okay so so, yeah. so for example el reforma is yeah. the leading is very influential yeah. la jornada is el reforma is to the right of the center yeah. la jornada is to the left of the center okay. so these are the two leading newspapers where you know if you can make if you can write articles there or publicize through them yeah. it could become an, an, an important thing okay. uh, but again if you do it once it's not going to have an impact it has to be a sustained effort yeah. it has to be over a period of time otherwise this sort of thing will not happen so maybe to start a discussion a debate a public debate could be yeah could be yeah. uh, and, and things like that. Do you, do you have examples of, of how this has happened before in Mexico, like with HIV maybe? Or? With HIV it did happen. Okay. Uh, when did that happen? Um, you know? Initially, you know, uh, HIV was not considered a big deal in most Latin American countries yeah. when it happened in the 80s in the US. But in the late 90s, but when the Millennium Goal came about in the United Nations, yeah. that's that's when a lot of Latin American countries paid a great deal of interest, okay. uh, get a great deal of attention. So that's that's when when this thing started, and uh, Seguro Popular was uh, the initiative of uh, the, the the Minister of Health at that time. Uh, he's now the Dean of Health uh, School in Harvard, and he was the and he was a physician, and he was also a champion for that cause. So he pushed for the Seguro Popular. Yeah. And so that's that's how the, the whole thing came about. So there has to be somebody in the government who has, who takes an initiative or interest in one particular thing. Okay, so he would be influential maybe, this team. He would be very influential. Okay. He would be, he's, he's at Harvard, but he's still, you know, when he does, says something or does something, people here pay. 